Ой, и Кэмпелл-Жозе, и Баргетнер убили. The city of Sume, 10 kilometers away from the city, and no end in sight. In the first days of the full-scale invasion, the vehicles entered the city of Sume from three directions. It came from Suja through the Yunokivka checkpoint to Sume, then through the Krasnopil direction through Ugroidi to Krasnopil and to Sume. And the third one, unfortunately, is not on the map. It's Tyotkno Rzhuvka. So, the number of vehicles around Suja Yunakivka was about 1,000 to 1,200 units. The main columns tried to bypass Sume by detours because they realized that if they got caught in a battle somewhere, they would lose some of their military equipment. And it was decided, as I understand from the analysis of their commanders, to bypass some cities. Key military units, so that as much equipment as possible could reach the city of Kiev. The tanks went to Kimik. A convoy of vehicles with red armbands. They were moving in small groups, armored groups of three to four vehicles. Reconnaissance by combat. This is a standard Soviet tactic, and they worked like that as well. Russian soldiers without flags. Soldiers with red armbands. Moving down Kharkivska Street. On February 24th at 3 a.m., I received a call from the brigade commander and was told to get your men to arms. I asked, has it started? And he replied, yes, it started. And in fact, in about half an hour, I was already in the unit. People started arriving. There were professional military personnel, yet not many of them, about 50 in total. Reservists, up to about 100 people, and people, civilians, came, and they were put to arms. On the first day, there were probably more than a thousand people here, all standing, getting uniforms, getting weapons. A brigade was beginning to form near the artillery. Weapons were given to people who came to sign up for the brigade. They received weapons in different places, and it was in this place that they received weapons. I took my military ID card, took my passport, and rode this legendary bicycle to the depot to receive the weapons. I showed my passport, got let in, and then I received my weapons in one of the warehouses and went home. As I was passing along Soborna Street, someone filmed me from the window and after posted it on the internet. An old man driving, a usual guy. Those concerned Sume residents, like-minded people, former military servicemen, we agreed to eventually gather at the Sume lift base. There were not many people. The core was seven to eight people, up to ten. 
These were the people who knew we had gathered before. They had already been divided into areas. Who will be doing what activity when the invasion would take place? There was something already being bombed in the distance. Another column was coming. Infantry, grenade launchers. Before that, armored personnel carriers and tanks were passing by. The city military commissariat was working here. They had several premises. Basically, all the people with documents were called for military service. Based on approximate calculations, there were about 1,000 to 1,200 people. No one counted them. These are the numbers that come from our cooks, disposable cups, plates. So many people passed through here. The basement of the Sume lift. The bassoons. So let's go. My friends told me, hey, come by to Pasilska Street. We arrived, battalion, battalion. What kind of battalion? Then court, court. I don't understand why the court. And then I realized, judicial protection, logically, a court. I met the commander, Makar Babich. They are very decent people. I wanted to help somehow. I'd go here, make arrangements, go elsewhere, see if I could find something. People called me and I passed on the information. I don't know what else I could have done to help. What I could have done? Better something than nothing. On February 24th, paratroopers from the 81st Brigade, the 5th BTG, came to our location in the former art school. We bow low and sincerely thank them for their courage and heroism, because without them it would have been very, very difficult. They simply inspired the personnel who were there. We were looking at them and realized that victory would definitely be ours even then. The column was standing here, above the road. We opened fire to kill them, and they started to run away. The first Kamas truck that arrived here was carrying separatists. A representative of the territorial defense approached them and asked, Where are you guys from? Who are you? What are you? And then the noise started. Shoot, guys, these are the occupiers. When we smashed them, our guys went to see what they were carrying. They were carrying parade uniforms, medals for the capture of Kiev, Kharkiv, and Sumy. The awards were already there. Russian license plates taped over. We hit some Russian equipment near Sumy. Just trash. I was driving up. It was all destroyed. The equipment was burnt. And here is a Russian orc, a young guy, about 20 years old, killed under this curb. And I said, why the hell did you come here? To find your death here? And you did. So on February 24th to 25th, we started working. It was decided to produce a large quantity, the maximum number of mobile groups for, let's say, small strikes against the enemy. It was more of a guerrilla operation. We saw the Russians running, abandoning their equipment, and they did not understand where they could be attacked from. So it went on and on, and in principle, it had the maximum effect. Так. 
We received information that a column of Russian vehicles was moving from the direction of Kotin. It was a convoy of vehicles, and we don't know exactly what its composition was, but we only knew that it was heading to the direction of Sume. And it was in this area that we saw a car on the way out of the city going to the city. We passed it by. It was a Ural, as I remember, with a big kung. There was a driver and a passenger on the right side of it, and it was clearly visible that they were wearing red armbands. We decided to make a U-turn, radioed to our comrades. There was also another car with our fighter with us. Turned around in this area and started to catch up. After we realized that the rashes car was going to enter the city, I decided that we would catch up with them, open the side door of the T5 Volkswagen transporter and open fire on them. That's what we did. After opening fire on the Rachists, they abruptly stopped their car. We turned around and drove up to the Rachists' car from behind. After that, we opened fire on them. During this battle, at first, I was sitting in the passenger seat of this car. And therefore, as you can see from the hits, Half of the bullets were intended for me, and half for the driver of this car. The car was stopped there. I chose a position behind the bus stop and started aiming at the Ural. When I realized that I was being returned fire, the ground with snow started to rise. I took up the position here. When I started running out of ammo, I decided to play a trick and said, you have 30 seconds to think or we'll fuck you with an RPG. After I realized that they started to give up, we saw two wounded. One had two bullet wounds, the other three. We saw that there was a third one from the video that was filmed by locals, I think from this house. He was wounded, a Russian with red bandages. Look, he came out to help. Take them as prisoners. Oh, they are wounded, they surrender. After Kurska Street, I took him to the regional hospital. He had an interesting wound in the thigh. He had a passport and an RGO grenade there. And when I hit him in the thigh, the grenade pierced two millimeters from the fuse. Both of them were really lucky. I think we wouldn't have been able to talk to him here. I wonder, what is the purpose of their visit to us? I realized that nobody needs this dud at all. I drove him around the city like a bride. I didn't know what to do with him. And then I called my mom. She works at the school. Can I have the keys? Because I don't know what to do with him. He stayed in this room. We put two soldiers here to guard him. There was a sofa here. There are still traces of blood on it. I am Tuprov Alexei Evgenevich, born on April 14, 1998 from the city of Zerzinsk, Nizhny Novgorod region. I fell behind the convoy, came under fire, tried to return fire, but to no avail. To save my life, I laid down my weapon, after which Ukrainian doctors provided me with medical care for which I am grateful. Here we interrogated him, asked him who he was, where he's from, and called his parents. As far as I know, he was immediately exchanged. I still have his parents' number. 
I think I will call them after the war. I won't do it now. I'm just wondering what he thinks about this situation, whether he went on to fight or not. When we heard that this battle had taken place here, that the collectors had shot this kung, we already realized that there were no more collectors in the collection cars. The territorial defense was riding the cars. So we immediately came here. And many city residents who took up arms did the same. We started to organize chaotically here. People were coming. Locals were showing up. There was such euphoria that everyone started to meet this convoy. Moreover, there was information that some fuel trucks were coming from Stetskivka. And everyone in high spirits began to prepare for defense. And then people began to gather. Right here, under this wall, they began to bring ammunition, grenades and boxes, assault rifles and RPGs. And people began to master it quickly. Up to the point where a young guy was standing with grenades, frightened, asking how to use them. I took out my phone to support these guys. There's a video of us starting. We start the action. The resistance, the guys are all practicing. A motivational video for our own. Everything is cool, everyone is working. I wanted to memorize people's faces, who was there, for those who will be interested later. For history, like a photo in memory, that's how it all started. We took the trophies and loaded a full Niva car. Grandpa, you're so cool. Did you serve under Kovpak? Well, brothers, we have one more cross truck. This is our summit defense page, which appeared much later. All these videos were posted much later. We had another page on TikTok. It was banned, probably because the Russians complained, and it was blocked. But we got 30,000 subscribers in two days. It was unexpected. I'm telling you, I was coming home. We have a parking spot at home. I open the gate, there's a shelling or an air raid, and the parking spot is full of people. They're all scared with strollers. Some are going to bed, some are old ladies. Whenever my neighbors saw me coming home, they used to ask questions about the situation in town. I used to sit in the middle, and they would gather all around me, and I would show them the videos and pictures I had taken. After a few times like that, they were waiting for me every day, asking if I had any news and new videos. That inspired me to keep recording. On the 26th of February, my friend and I found out that Russians were supposedly attacking Sume. So, weapon in hand, we headed right there from Kurska Street. We were hiding behind that pole. There was the Kontimirov's division exploring the area. Our soldiers used a grenade launcher and hit one of that division's vehicles, which then rapidly left. Another Russian vehicle stayed there and was trying to open fire at us. We had two vehicles, 11 people. The first shot belonged to our grenade launcher operator, with the call sign DID. The soldiers of Russian Federation, who were sitting on the top of the IFV, fell down like skittles in bowling. Part of our squad stayed at that crossing, while one of our team and I ran across the yard over there. 
and came to Russians from behind to open fire at them there. Another Russian vehicle stops right in front of us and we open the fire at them using small arms. Our grenade launcher operator made a second shot, but he missed. Russians regrouped. They were scared because they realized they would not pass through. That is why they started leaving. They were trying to get through Bilopolska Street, but they got stuck in the field. During this fight, two of our soldiers got injuries. No one got killed. And from the Russian side, approximately six of them were killed. Their bodies were lying on the ground. Good job. They knocked one of the tanks down. There was a Ukrainian military vehicle missing by the tracks near the Edoway store. It was left by the guys from the 81st Brigade, and we decided to fix it and then go seize the Russian APC. We knew their APC entered Sume, but we did not know its exact location. It took us two days to repair the vehicle. Civilians helped us. We found the accumulators, filled up the tank, and went to look for that APC. We walked on foot to explore the areas and found where the APC was located as well as how many of those so-called warriors. Russian fascists were there and realized that we would not be able to seize their APC without the IFV. When we came closer to Russians, we found where their machine gunner's position was. The APC was empty. Russians were hiding in the woods near the vehicle. As they knew that sooner or later, we would come to get them. That is where we got them. They surrendered because they had understood that it was not where they thought they were going. Russians realized they were about to be having a tough time. Russians kept begging to let them go. That is how it was. After that, we fixed the seized military vehicle and continued our fight. It was more or less in a good shape. However, the left middle tire was off, as was the transmission. The vehicle was fully packed with the required ammo for cannon, as well as machine gun, though. They're shooting. Those military vehicles that we seized from the battlefields, we kept evacuating those to the municipal enterprise, Sume Miskzbitslo. Almost until the month of July, it was all there, and our crew of mechanics was working on them. There were missing details needed for certain vehicles. We were searching for them. Sometimes we had to use donors' details, sometimes grinding out those details and fixing the vehicles this way. This lens was damaged after a grenade launcher shot, and we had it in one copy. Most of the missing details were unique, and we tried to do our best to make it work. First days, we were working until 12 a.m., then we would be going home using the passwords and get back to work at 7 a.m. Once we were back at work, each of us had their own task. The work was divided into parts. One task goes to you, another goes to another person. Basically, we knew what we would be doing first thing in the morning, as some tasks took time, meaning that there was always work to do.
When we were taking this vehicle, it happened on the road, and there were lots of Russians all around us. I was not alone as well. Some of the guys who came with me got scared when they saw all that happening before their own eyes. Some of them told me, Oleg, it's horrible. They're shooting. It's a real front line. I guess I should leave. I replied, you may go if you wish. We will stay. Once we brought that vehicle to our garage, we found out that it was very important to have it. It was priceless. The vehicle has a crane arm, which is very useful to get out something heavy, pull up the cabin. Also, it has a truck box with different tools. Glory to Ukraine! Glory to the heroes! I used to get home from combat assignments by 9 p.m. I had a thought that people were hiding in shelters, basements, and they were scared. We heard the raid alert, and to save our lives and the lives of our children, we went to the shelter. And so I thought that the anthem of Ukraine would support the people's spirit. During the cold February late evenings, after assignments, I used to play the Ukrainian anthem on trumpet at the balcony of my apartment. After playing, I used to shout, glory to Ukraine, and people would respond, glory to heroes. I felt glad because I knew I was helping people, fostering their spirit. I was driving 40 meters without a tire. Thank God all is good and we're alive. I'll call you later after I change the tire. The name of our squad is translated as Fighting Dwarves. It was Andri's idea. We all are not the tallest guys. I'm 1.65 meters. Sergei Rudenko, our sniper, is 1.72 meters. Andrei is a bit taller. The tallest of us is Igor. He is just standing a bit lower now. We might not be tall, but we are fighters. Around 3 p.m., the commander informed our squad that we got the information about the Russians. From our local small group managed by Viktor, call sign Lesnik, they would tell us what to do. We were told that a group of Russians acting freely tried to organize their checkpoint near the pond in Krasnopilia. When we got there, it was in the evening, about 1 to 1.5 hours before it got dark outside. And what we saw there was three Russian tanks and an APC. I did not notice that there was a group of Russians in the field. As it turned out, there were 10 to 12 of them. Some were on the road, some went to collect the firewood. And what happened next was that I saw two Russians with empty water bottles moving towards our positions to get some water. That is when I heard a shooting. Here's what happened. Our soldiers with a grenade launcher exposed themselves while moving down the road. So Russians opened the fire using the tracers. 
Once I heard the shooting, I understood that they opened the fire at our guys. I decided to switch to single shots. Towards this exact place, on the opposite side, there were Russian fascists getting the water under the dam. I made a decision right away to open the fire at them using the single shots. They got quiet. I thought I killed both. It turned out I did not. I mean, one of them was killed from a shot in his head, and another was wounded. The wounded one tried shooting periodically, so I was shooting as well. Then he got quiet. After that, Russians opened the fire at us using the APC's machine gun. The trees were falling down. We realized we had to step back. It was terrifying. We thought we could die there. Local citizens told us there were lots of dead bodies. When Andrei opened the fire, our soldiers at the field also started shooting. Mosinka, SVD, two assault rifles, many of Russians were killed. Thank God we all survived, caused losses and damages to enemies, and all returned home alive. As it turned out later, they left the Krasnopelia's checkpoint thanks to us. When we got the information that Russian APC had entered the city, we headed from Troitska Street to Geroyev Krut Street, where the APC was spotted. Dead Russians are lying on top of the moving APC. Once we reached to Troitska Street, the APC had already moved further. So we were asking citizens walking down the streets, and they were guiding us on where they had last seen the vehicle. They told us it was moving down Lenia Street, and once we turned to the railway track, we spotted the APC. We saw one dead Russian of landing forces on top of the vehicle. And there was one civilian sitting beside the APC. When invading Sume, Russians never thought we would meet them with a fierce fire. I do not think they were expecting us to meet them with flowers, but they clearly did not anticipate the resistance they faced. We did not understand why they had decided to run away on foot. It was the 27th Motorized Rifle Brigade mostly. Five of them were from the 27th, and one more was a military policeman from the 1st Motorized Rifle Regiment of the Taman Division. The ground was still wet. We noticed the footprints, got through a hole in the fence, and heard there was someone moving. We shouted that they had to capitulate. They shouted back, do not shoot, we have a civilian with us. Russians threw their weapons aside and lay down on the ground. We came closer, and it turned out that the civilian that they captured was the keeper at the place they were hiding at. There were two Russians, both were injured. One had a wounded leg, and another had both a leg and an arm injured. To provide the first aid, we asked Russians if they had anything in the first aid kit to treat the wounds. It turned out the only thing they had was an old tourniquet of Soviet Union times. 
Those Russian soldiers got injuries when they were passing by the checkpoint at Kharkivska Street, where our soldiers opened the fire at them using the machine guns. On the 27th of February, I was present at the interrogations of the Russian fascists. All of them were different. Some were dirty, some covered in blood, some terribly smelled, and some were scared. During their interrogations, they all used to say the same thing, that they came from military training and they had received no other information from their commanders. However, one of them looked very different. It was a purebred officer, very clean, with a true enemy stare. I had no idea who he really was, but he told us he was sent to keep the order in Sume and ensure the traffic, to perform police functions. That Russian soldier who was of military police was exchanged for five of our territory defense soldiers within the first few days after we captured him. If I'm not mistaken, it was on the 1st of March. As far as I know, it was the first official exchange of war prisoners since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I am Nikitin Yuri Alexandrovich, born in 1997, Omsk city. Who should you be exchanged for? For your military personnel? On the 28th of February, at this very place, we started organizing the defense of Sume outskirts at the Baranovsky direction. That's where we mounted the blocks and where the line of fortification was built. That is when the Russian groups came at us. What happened was, the Russian tank was destroyed in Tokari. The rest of Russian troops, who were following that tank in an APC, somehow got through Tokari. When they got to the road, they could not hold on to it, and the vehicle got overturned. Then they stopped one of the locals driving down the road, took his car, and put that civilian into the trunk. He gave them the keys to the car, but they did not want to take them. They put him behind the wheel. Five men climbed into this kopeka, threw grenade launchers and weapons into the trunk and left here. Their checkpoint was literally 400 meters from here. It's just that this driver took them here on purpose. When they saw the roadblock, they jumped out and fired two shots at our positions from a hand grenade launcher. We wounded one immediately. Local residents brought him here, took him as a prisoner, and four escaped. The system is called a bottle thrower, two calibers. One is for a beer bottle, and this one is for a bigger diameter. A bottle with a combustible mixture is inserted into the barrel. Pressure is applied, and then the shot just happens. We checked. A bottle with a flammable mixture can fly about 200 meters without extinguishing. Thank you.
Everything that will manage to come to this point, it will not cause any problems, because here we will sort it out with small arms. Everything else, the caterpillar tracks will be burned somewhere on the border. When the documents were transferred to the hospital in Kyiv, they called back and asked where the main document was. We asked, which one? They replied, the death certificate. They said that a person cannot live after such injuries. I say, I'm talking to you myself. It can't be like that. They did not believe that I survived such injuries and remained alive. We received information from residents about the movement of enemy vehicles, that this convoy is moving, shooting civilian cars, firing indiscriminately at local buildings. They were driving from Nizhnya Sirovatka, moving along the highway in the direction of Bobrik. Nizhnya Sirovatka, they're coming. As far as we knew, the convoy consisted of units of the Russian Guard and the Kantemir Division. On the first day, at approximately 11 o'clock, our group of 10 people moved to this place in civilian cars. We were armed with three RPGs, one RPK, and Kalishnikovs. Where to meet? Further, there are fields. Well, we found where we can more or less stop the convoy on the bridge. This is my position with Sashko. My task was to stop the leading tank at any cost. I fired only at the leading tank even though there was a cistern here, and there other good targets. Well, what's the motivation? As soon as I saw how many of them crawled out, I thought, this is it, Yura, this is the end. I missed the first shot, but three shots hit the tank on the side. We understood that some group was fighting. That is why we ran here to the bridge to help them and entered the battle already from different sides. The battle began. The first 10 to 15 seconds, it was complete horror. We started retreating to our cars, and it was probably a mistake, at about a distance of 500 to 600 meters. When we started to jump into the cars, we suffered all the main losses. All the fire was shifted to the cars. They concentrated fire on our cars from tank machine guns. The car was fired upon. After 10 meters, I heard that it drove into the field. Someone shouted, the driver was killed. And a strong, strong blow landed on my back. As it turned out later, the guys found my plate carrier. There were 5.45 caliber there, several bullets entered. The impact simply knocked me down. A roadblock was organized on Bilopolska, and a plate carrier was brought by volunteers. They said they found one plate, we'll bring you another one in the evening. I had a walkie-talkie in the front, and a bunch of other things, body kits, grenades, magazines. It was inconvenient to wear the plate on the front, so I put it on my back. If they hadn't given me that plate, I wouldn't be standing here right now. Maybe they will recognize me, see me, and learn that it was them who brought it. So maybe I will find them and find out who these people were. Gunshot wound to the head, the impact fractured the skull, and a cyst was formed. Then the hand, here the bullet entered, here it came out. Then the shoulder, they removed a 5.45 bullet, the chest was stitched, all the soft tissue was sewn, 
and the shrapnel remained in the back. And the left leg, the bullet entered here, exited here, the impact broke the heel. When we were being taken out of here, they came across another Russian convoy and they hid, drove us back and forth for two hours. They hid with us in the forest, where they could, where the car could drive. Well, I sat until the Russians turned to the field and left. I was in position until the last second. He also smoked twice. Yes, I also smoked two cigarettes. Well, it's inconvenient for me to shoot at empty cars. I couldn't do it on tanks. I already had an empty RPG. And shooting small arms at tanks is ridiculous. I was waiting for them to come here. They tried, but there was a territorial defense on the other side, on the side of the railway road, so they did not dare to move further. They ran across the bridge and saw that the convoy was already stopped. They saw an armored personnel carrier was already hit in the middle of the road in front of the convoy, and one vehicle filled with ammunition was on fire. The ammunition was fiercely exploding. We split into two groups. One group was from this side, and they came up with a grenade launcher to hit this tank. And our group stretched along the edge of the forest, and we began to fight with those who were hiding behind the roadside. The first group met them, so to speak, from the front side, and they were trying to hide on the other side of the roadway. It was our group that began to drive them back. The battle began on all sides. Basically, we surrounded this convoy from three sides, and we caused as much damage as we could with our small arms. Out of ten alive, we have five left. We have only one soldier left unharmed, without wounds. His call sign, did. He was not affected by anything. He came on his own feet and left on his own. In memory of those who died, we should put a stella or a memorial sign here. Because these five are heroes. They gave their lives for the city, for Ukraine. Their surnames are Kulik, Alexander, Vasilyovich, Movchan, Ruslan, Cherstyuk, Klochko, and Korjan, Alexander, Ivanovich. This is our commander. People knew about them. As it began, we had somewhere around 20 men, no more. New people arrived every day. 
There was only one question for them. Were they ready to resist and participate in combat actions? If the answer was yes, that's all we needed. We were lucky to have good engineers in the group of people who arrived. An electrician approached me. And we began to focus on laying and mining roads, blowing up the convoys to stop them. At the same time, there was some work with the operators of Baraktars. Three different convoys were blown up on the Lebedinsky circle. On March 6, the group already knew that large convoys of armored vehicles and other enemy weapons constantly passed through this section of the road. That is, even before that there were several convoys that passed through this section of the road. <laughs> We have decided that it would be effective and expedient to ambush and carry out a flank attack right here in this area. In this area, the MTLB detachment was previously hit by an RPG-7V. That is, this MTLB was chosen as a masking agent and the explosive device was installed on it. I went to this position with the Fransus around 7 in the evening. We are standing here now. We can see the place of the explosive device installation. Now it is daylight, but at that moment it was night. It was dark. And we did not understand where exactly our secret was installed. They were driving and they had blue blinking lights. Three cars without a beacon, one with a beacon light. And I followed this beacon and saw that it disappeared in one place for literally three seconds, and then it appeared again. I concluded that this is the place of initiation. Good, beautiful morning. At this place, with the help of Danka, we made a secret and stopped the convoy for an hour and a half. In fact, when I saw in the morning that I had hit an APC, I was upset. I wanted to hit some tank. But when I found out that it was a command armored personnel carrier, I was pleasantly surprised, but I learned this later. It turned out well. I calculated correctly. It was March 8th, and the funny thing is that they blew up in the same spot. We have received information that there were Uragan systems in the convoy in the amounts of five to eight vehicles.
Ну, упанули по урагану, я думаю, он не залез, просто что они его не бросили утащили. Ну, ну отвечаю, рубануло лучше, чем в первый раз. В этот раз повеселее дела обстоят. I chose such a target to both inflict damage and stop the convoy so that our Turkish airlines could work them off. Baraktars have been working on the territory of Sume Oblast since the first days. They inflicted very precise clear blows on the enemy's convoys and ammunition. And the most important thing that I liked about this work with the Bayraktars was that the gunners of these Bayraktars were all people, all Ukrainians who united in such a strong fist. These were both simple farmers and people's deputies of Ukraine. It's quite an interesting thing, in absolute silence, because it flies at a fairly high altitude, you can't hear anything. You see just two flashlights, launches of rockets, and then such a clear metallic sound. You can't confuse it with anything. That is, you clearly understand that it is the Bayrek that hit the target. We did not come up with it ourselves, but somehow it was born. This is the popular name, Hot Bartenders. That is to say, we had a bar here, in which we poured such infernal drinks, and these infernal drinks then burned orcs. The very first case when our cocktails worked and burned the armored vehicles was at the entrance to Sume under the monument. First, a tank was set on fire, followed by an armored vehicle called Riz. The tank did not burn completely, but the RIS was destroyed completely. Well, then some people were upset, because it was possible to seize these vehicles and use it. But we were hot then, young and hot. We didn't understand that. Later, we started to capture vehicles, the ones that were possible to capture. We are looking for those bastards who left the tank. The captured vehicles were the second gift from our hot bartenders. Welcome to hell. This is the exit from the Kharkiv Highway to Stare Selo. Here, on March 7th, we had our first battle with a convoy of enemy vehicles, and there were 12 of us then. We were already on our way to the task, that is to say, we carried out reconnaissance, flew with a drone. We were already returning home and spotted the enemy here, who had just left head-on. They started firing, although we were driving in ordinary civilian cars. I ordered, convoy, stop, everybody, take cover. All the guys stopped, and we jumped into the ditch. In fact, this was the only chance. If we shot back, the convoy would not stop and pass by, and this would give at least some chance to survive. Basically, that's how it turned out. We started firing their armored vehicles and personnel. There were three vehicles, the first airborne typhoon, the second Kamaz-based typhoon, the third was a tented Ural with personnel. When they passed us, 
I held a roll call and already heard that there were KIAs. I checked every person and realized that we had both KIAs and WIAs, that is, they were breathing, they were conscious. We decided to take them out quickly, load them into cars, and drive to Sume. They died in the hospital. These boys are buried with the entire squad on the Alley of Heroes. But these are the places where their parents planted flower beds. These are the very places where their cars with boys were shot. Before the war, I did not expect that I would ever pick up a weapon. And in general, I did not have such a mindset. I preached love to people. And when it came to protecting those to whom I preached, I had no doubt that I was doing the right thing. I go to protect those to whom I preached this love, whom I love, who are important to me. Because I didn't invite those people here who came to kill us. On the morning of March 7th, I received a phone call from my friend, who was also fighting. This was Volodya Zolotoyov. He said they needed support. They were firing a convoy, a large one. I got up and called Andriy Avramenko, told him to take his boys, and we had to meet in two minutes and leave for Ivozan. Upon arrival here, we saw that the boys were already collecting prisoners, helped to catch them. When we were returning, our birds, which were ahead in Yunakivka, I was informed that a convoy was entering from the direction of Yunakivka and was going in our direction. Andres and my groups, seven people in total, went up here, parked our cars not far from here in the forest and returned here, took our positions. When the tank approached, it began to fire from below. That is to say, the machine guns of the Tiger and the tank were shooting, and the cannon started firing. This is where the ambush was. Andriy Horbatenko, a grenade launcher, fired a shot and hit the tank with a well-hit shot. Then it turned out that a convoy had entered. There was an armored personnel carrier and a tiger of some kind. They stopped in Kianitsia at the entrance to the dam. And even higher, in front of Kraproshivna, the main convoy stopped. So it was a very high risk, but it was worth it. On March 7th, the last convoy passed here. They are afraid of this place. 
And it was exactly March 7th. Me and my wife had an anniversary of our life together. I wrote to her the day before that I would not be able to greet her, so I would send her a bouquet and a photo. And so it turned out that I sent a photo of these prisoners. And she told me that she had never expected a more beautiful bouquet. There were 13 people, one officer, one commando, four to five conscripts, the rest were contractors. Everyone was saying that they arrived for training. They did not know where they were going. But if the conscripts were scared, they may have been forced to go here. But the contractors understood where and why they were going. The last point of deoccupation was on April 3rd, when retreating Russian troops blew up the Chumakov Bridge. And this was the last day when Russian heavy equipment and troops crossed the same river and blew up the bridge. It was in the evening of the 2nd of April. On April 3rd, before noon, we still tried to catch and finish off the losers, as we called them then. And basically, it was the last day when the territory of the Sumer region was completely deoccupied. The phenomenon of Sume is in its citizens who gathered. Sume has been defended heroically. But there were few of us. But we acted very quickly and coherently. It was a round-the-clock job. That is, intelligence, counterintelligence, subversive and tactical intelligence converged in the same people. Everyone was a universal fighter. The most difficult thing was that the staff that came to me was disorganized. But no matter what, God saved us. We took a prisoner and asked him why they didn't start attacking Sume, didn't start capturing. He said there were 15,000 nationalists, to which my friend punched him and said 15,200. <laughs> Well, not 200, a little more. Everyone who remained, they didn't know how it would end, right? When you stay, you don't know what will happen. This is how I felt on March 8th, when there was the first Green Corridor. When the civilian convoy left the city, it was from the roadblock on Romenska to the bus station, one tail, and the second to the mountain of Prokofiev. They were coming out of the city. I will tell you that the emotions are overflowing. The people who left, they baptized us. In the eyes of everyone in this convoy, it was that they were saying goodbye to us. And that is why I believe that those who remained are the heroes. Two more ran out there. There is one more man. Another one runs. Sashka. Civilians recaptured the city from the Russians. Territorial defense worked well, right from the first minutes. And those who were engaged in territorial defense are very valuable people for the city of Sume. Because on the 24th, you know, the city was empty. But when on the 25th, they began to converge in a geometric progression. They were getting out, so people stayed. And until now, the skeleton that was there in the early days, these are now all active militaries. Mm -hmm. 
No one knew to what extent people would unite, how much people would be ready to pick up a weapon and simply fight for their lives, for the lives of their loved ones, their relatives. It's just unreal. And to defend for our city itself, and this is precisely the factor that the armed forces did not consider. In their manuals, there are no paragraphs where people just pick up weapons and fight for their country. 